Welcome to Mercenaries and Gunslingers, the criminal defense podcast. You're about to join Louisville attorney Tim Dennison as he discusses important issues related to state and federal criminal charges. Tim has defended clients in over 100 jury trials. As a Kentucky trial lawyer, Tim knows what it takes to get evidence suppressed, prosecutors second-guessed, and juries convinced. So get ready for this episode of Mercenaries and Gunslingers, the criminal defense podcast. All right, welcome back for episode four. Today, we're in the studio with Louisville criminal defense attorney Tim Dennison, and we're going to be talking about drug charges, different aspects of this. Tim, drug charges, drug crimes, it's a big part of your practice. It is. And is that something that's kind of developed over time, or is that just, if you're dealing in criminal law, that's that's there's just enough of it out there? Both. It's developed over time, but if you're if you're practicing criminal law, it's one of the staple charges that you look for. Well, let's talk, I mean, you've been litigating for almost 30 years, coming up on 29 years. Talk to us uh, really how the, how the uh, landscape has changed, I guess, over the past 20 so years. Uh, you've been involved with this for quite some time. I mean, are there trends that you're seeing? Obviously, certain issues crop up, certain drugs crop up over time, and, and it just, uh, the landscape's probably changed in the last 20 years or so. It has. Um, when I first uh, broke into the business, uh, cocaine was your uh, that was your that was your number one drug, uh, possession, trafficking, uh, but that was that was the hot ticket item. Uh, then as, as time started to shift, it really uh, it really came became methamphetamine uh, took the top spot, and uh, cocaine's always been around, but it's really. It, by all accounts, it's it's been in decline since the late seventies and eighties uh, as the the drug, uh, but it's always out there. Right. But it it occupies uh, much less of a uh, of a presence uh, today than it did back in the late eighties, early nineties. Right. In, in years ago, I mean, we did have a, a giant onslaught of meth. I mean, it was everywhere, and we're still dealing with that to to an extent. To an extent, yes. Um, wh- what about marijuana? Has that has that ebb flowed? I mean, kind of what what's? Well, it, it was it was steady for the longest time, and then there was a there was a push, um, late nineties, two thousand, uh, to increase the penalties for marijuana. Um, that lasted a little bit, but it didn't didn't garner a lot of support. Uh, and now, um, marijuana, unless it's in just a vast quantity, um, the county attorney's office here really doesn't prosecute possession of marijuana cases anymore. Um, the feds will, uh, but again, they're looking for they're looking for quantity too. So a little bit of marijuana uh, in, t- in today's current environment, nobody really cares. Nobody really cares. But but I guess that brings us into. Now what we're dealing with is this opioid crisis, and this must be clogging up courts left and right. It is. It is. It's uh, in part been responsible for the uh, development of the drug program um, in Kentucky, but the the current the current choice drug that's creating so many problems um, is heroin. That's the. That's that's big on the scale now. And what do you think drives that? Is that is that the the high or is that the cost of it? I mean, I I, I always heard meth was cheap. That's why everybody was using it. But um, how does how does heroin come in on this? I, I think the both of those things uh, certainly the cost of it. Right, uh, it's inexpensive. Um, you know, plus the synthetics that are involved in not only that but the opioids. The um, it's it's driven the price down on those things. And they're a lot easier to manufacture or learn how to manufacture now. Wow. And, and I guess unlike marijuana, which needs some room for cultivation, needs some room for processing, it's relatively easy to make this stuff. It is. Wow. That's that's amazing. I, I know that that's something that we hear a lot uh, here in, in Louisville, Jefferson County, but statewide and nationally. I mean, obviously, that's been a big deal. Now, has that, you know, the way the prosecutors approach these drug crimes and, and these drug charges that come along with them. How much of that's politically driven versus, you know, this is, um, this is just something we're amping up today. You don't see a lot of politically driven, um, so as administrations come in and to it, relief. 
it's it's pretty it's pretty much attacked head on and directly. There's not a lot of politics involved other than when you're chasing the big one. Right. And and you want the big score of drugs, wherever that may be. Uh but for the most part, it's it's not it's it's prosecutors doing their job. Right. It, um okay. if it's if it it can be a possession which is a small amount for personal use. Um if they determine that there's a lot of drugs involved of any type, it can go up to a trafficking charge. Um, and then in methamphetamine, again, it's so cheap to, to manufacture that there's a manufacturing and distribution aspect of that, that is separate and apart from just the distribution. Well, and that's a question I had was just the difference between distribution and trafficking. I thought they were kind of the same thing. Well, they are, but distribution could be, um, could be as as simple as me giving you a little packet of whatever pick me up, right? But not really selling it, not not putting it out there for sale to the general public. But if I were just to slide you one, and somebody saw that, that that would technically be a distribution. Okay, okay. okay. Um, or as trafficking is still involves that element of it, but trafficking, you're buying and selling. Right. There's an exchange, but there's also compensation. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. There doesn't have to be any compensation for uh, for just the distribution, although normally there is. Sure. I'm just using that hand delivery from me to you as yep. an example. Um, but if you're, if you're selling it, you know, either buying or selling it, then theoretically there's, and, and paraphernalia, uh, always blends into that uh, that time that type of of charge, and that's the thing I, th- I think a lot of people you know forget is that you can still be charged with paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia, just having that, and that that could be scales and baggies and and other, other other means of 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 uh, using drugs or whatever. Whereas maybe I don't have the drugs on me at the time, but there's still these ancillary charges that can right. come up. And does that happen often? Is that used as a is a an add on, or is that sometimes they go out and they said, no, we're going to charge you with this on a standalone charge, more or less. They you, they can. It's usually an add on or an after the fact because if some drugs aren't recovered, it makes it a lot more difficult to prove that it's paraphernalia. Exactly. Uh, but if there are drugs involved uh, with the um, with that particular incident, right. or uh, or arrest it. If there's a possession, there's usually a paraphernalia with it. Okay. There's rarely a paraphernalia by itself, although it can happen. Right. Right. So it's a possibility, but again, I mean, just because I have a scale doesn't necessarily mean I'm committing a, a, a crime here. But Correct. if it's in connection with all of these items, for the most part, that are considered paraphernalia are things that we buy and consume every day. Right. Rubber yeah, gloves, kind of, yep. baggies. Masks, uh, masks, yeah, uh, all those things. Um, a roach clip, right? You know. Now, if again, those are very rarely charged, just as a separate crime. It's, again, um, stacked on, right? Tacked on. But if they, uh, if, if there's an, if there's enough of the drug that's in question, uh, and there's paraphernalia with it, that charge usually comes along with it too. Now, obviously. As we get into this, and, and you've got a tremendous amount of information about drug charges and, and criminal charges related to drug crimes on, on your website, um, both at the state and the federal level, things like that. You've got a, a couple of blog posts on there that talk about the uh, the issues with different types of substances, obviously having a different uh, level of penalty. You've got some some high level narcotics down to down to marijuana or something like that, right? And, and how is how is that determined, or why is that determined? Just more more of a, a harmful drug, I guess they want to. They're scheduled, right? Okay, and the more the more deadly or the more potent the drug uh, in question, the higher up the schedules it's gonna it's gonna be. Um, generally, we we refer to them as a schedule one through schedule four. Okay, schedule one being the the, the most hardcore drug, exactly. the most dangerous drugs. Exactly, that would be that would be cocaine. Uh, heroin, those types of things. Uh, depending on the drug, pos- uh, possession uh, could be possession second could be a misdemeanor. 
Okay. Uh, again, depending on, on the drug and the circumstances. Uh, possession third is always a misdemeanor. Uh, and then po possession of a Schedule 4 uh, generally is, too. Again, it depends on the drug. Right. Uh, some possessions are, are felony level and some possessions are. And it you, you determine that by the schedule okay. of the and, drug. And at that point, that's, that's what generates the charge right. from the prosecution. And Correct. Then, then you go to work, basically. Yes. Okay. And th how does intent come into play here. Um, obviously, personal use might be viewed differently than, well, I've got this and I do intend to traffic it. I sure. Mean, where does the intent come into play? Well, it, 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 where intent comes in is if, if you're found in possession of a quantity of drugs, a small amount, you could, you could not, you could not um, probably prove intent to distribute. There's just not enough to go around. Right. Yeah. I mean, person, most, most police officers, most prosecutors have a good idea of what personal use is and if it's personal use uh it's it's generally a misdemeanor or it's amended with a um with a direction to uh have some take some drug classes or um it's generally not referred to drug court unless uh unless it's a pretty severe case or the personal use has turned into an addiction and at that point yeah, they're it's, not only charging you to, to to deal with it, but they're also trying to help. Right, ideally. Right. You know, I um, several years ago, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Judge uh, Stephanie Burke, uh, who's been heavily involved in this uh, tra in this drug cr uh, court in Jefferson County, uh, there was a symposium or a, a CLE of some sort, and they mentioned that the Jefferson County Metro Jail basically is the largest detox center, I think, in the state. Does that does that sound right? Uh, that sounds right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm just amazed that that kind of volume. It's um, funny that uh, it's funny that you mentioned her because I was thinking to myself a, uh, a few days ago that I'd like to have her have her on the on this show possibly uh, before too long. And I mean, I can I can give you the ins and outs of it, but in terms of the legislation and the and the current movements, uh, she's she's up to speed. On no this. one's up to speed more than. Than Judge Burke. Yeah, th this has been a passion of hers for for many years. Yes, and, and it was actually when when the uh, drug court was started. It was actually started by Judge Henry Weber, who's retired now. Yep. And uh, several of several of his colleagues uh, began to branch out in it. Uh, Judge Steve Ryan was in drug court for quite some time. Um, Judge Mary Shaw has been involved. There's been quite a number of judges, both district and circuit, that have become involved with the project after its inception by Judge Weber. And uh, Judge, uh, Judge Burke came along, and uh, and she's, she's written on it, she's lectured on it, uh, and she, she probably has the best working knowledge of all the uh, avenues that are available for help, right. and uh, all the, you know, as well as all the uh, the penalties, um, it's, it's to some degree, uh, with the drug charges in recent years, they've, uh, they've yielded to what's called a graduated sanction. Uh, and that's not strictly drug cases, but it's in large part, it can be. And the graduated sanctions are if they're, uh, if they're in, if they're in drug court and they have a, uh, they have a positive, uh, if they come clean about it, the penalties are far less severe than if they, if they lie about it. Right. Um, right. And it's kind of built on a on a trust system. Um, and as long, basically, as long as you uh, and I don't want to oversimplify it, but basically, as long as you tell the truth and own it, you may get a you may get a small punishment, but it's not going to be it's not going to be terrible. Right. right. Uh, then there's the flip side of that if you. Uh, uh, get caught in possession, or um, or get caught got selling, and then you don't own up to it. That's a trip to jail for now sure. They're, now they're coming. Yes, and, and let's. I know we kind of outlined a little bit about this uh, this episode before we uh, before we turn everything on, but let's talk a little bit about that that uh, that focus. You know, there there are other other options available these days uh, for someone who's involved with uh, some drug charges. It's not just jail time. I mean, there is diversion. There is uh, counseling and, and therapy and, and this detox and things like that. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, as a criminal defense attorney, I mean, obviously I would think you'd really want to fight for that type of outcome 
more so than jail time. I mean, sure, you know, for the client. And, and the the focus has shifted from uh, in 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 many drug cases, the focus has shifted in recent years from punitive, punitive, punitive. Now the the tide is swinging back towards uh, treatment and and help if possible. Uh, rather than incarcerating them because the jails are overflowing, right? Already as, as it is. Yep. Well, so with that in mind, um, when a charge is made, when the prosecution decides, okay, this is what we're going to charge an individual with or a group of individuals with, it usually involves an, a number of issues. I mean, obviously, the amount of drugs in question, you know, what was seized or confiscated at that time, uh, along with the type. We talked about Schedule One, Schedule Four. Uh, and also, I guess the individual's uh, personal history. Sure. You know, um, do you want to walk us through that and kind of how that how that comes together? Well, uh, in in large part, if you, um, as I said, there's there's the the treatment aspect of it that it's that it's shifted to, but um, it's um, generally the focus now is treatment oriented. Now, a minute ago, you said when the prosecutor makes the decision on what to charge them with, generally that decision is made by the uh, arresting officer or officers at the time. Right, right there. They're going to they're going to establish what the what the pro, what the yes. crime was. Um, they can be amended. The charges can be amended. Um, they're generally not amended up after uh, there's been a determination. Uh, but for example, if this case uh, comes up, um, goes to the grand jury um, on some drug charges. They can certainly, uh, they can certainly add or subtract or uh, modify the charges that have been brought uh, to charges that they determine there's probable cause to believe were committed and that this particular defendant committed them. So they've got a little bit more latitude, I guess, depending on what the overall picture is here. They've got. There's not a lot of latitude to go up once right, it's been charged, right. uh, but there's quite a bit of latitude as to the disposition of the charge and how it'll be dealt with uh, going forward. So if again, this if it's personal use, it's going to be treated a little bit differently than if I'm caught with a a trunk load of of narcotics. Correct. I mean, obviously, there, there's there's a, a question there. The um, I always thought this was interesting, though, um, that an individual's history comes into play in, in in certain blogs and things like that. I think you uh, went down the road of talking about what is a persistent felony offender. How, sure. how does that come into play? Is that is that an aggravator? Is that what that's called? Well, yes, it can be an aggravator. Um, and, and if you would explain what an aggravator is and okay. how that works, an aggravator well. is a fact um, taken in conjunction with the circumstances that make the crime or the the activity worse, whereas a mitigator is a fact or circumstances taken uh, at the time of the of the crime that actually can lessen the severity of what was going on. Right. Okay. So I'm caught with this trunk full of drugs. I put them in there, and I was going to track it that traffic these. And in fact, I've been arrested four or five times for doing this versus, well, I borrowed this car and, oh my God, I didn't know what was in the trunk. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. If there's no other evidence tying you to drugs other than you borrowed the car, uh, that's a big proof problem Yeah. for the prosecutors. I'm just going to stick with Uber. I think it's safer. It probably is. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this persistent felony offender, kind of, kind of what, what is that? Okay. Okay. Everybody starts with a clean slate, at least at some point, uh, including juveniles who may or may not uh, plead guilty or be convicted of a crime in juvenile court. But at the end of that, it's still confidential. It can still be expunged. Um, with uh, a persistent felony offender, the first time that one is charged with a felony, uh, it probably gets amended unless it's a really serious crime. Um and that can happen, uh, or, or it can be diverted, right? Uh, which is really diversion came along about the same time I did, give or take, uh, at least in Jefferson County, and uh, it's gained popularity, uh, especially with people who don't have any significant criminal history, who may or may not have ever been uh, charged with any crime. Uh, so that gives gives a 
somebody who was experimenting or who got caught, uh, that gives them an opportunity to um, preserve their clean record if they comply with the diversion and the case is dismissed. And a diversion would be a counseling, a therapy of some sort, drug drug, drug therapy, alcohol therapy, if it's a DUI type thing. It, it, it really could be whatever the court orders. Right. And the, all of those things are true. Okay. Uh, but it also, the, you know, the court can order 50 Narcotics Anonymous uh, attendances a year or, you know, I'm, sure. uh, any, the, the, the real thing with, with a persistent felony offender, by the time you get to that stage, you're well down the road, if not already, a seasoned criminal. And the judge, the jury, if that's the case, uh, will be able to take those facts into consideration. They will. Wow. Now, okay. those type things, uh, PFO, those are, the defendant can be questioned on them if he takes the stand. But that is usually not entered. There's usually not any evidence entered in the guilt phase of the trial where they're determining whether or not the defendant is guilty of the crime. Uh, if there's going to be an enhancement, it's going to come later. The charge can be out there, but it'll, the, the enhancement will be addressed at the sentencing of the individual. And you're using this um, this word enhancement, but obviously I'm going to assume this is not a mitigating factor, this is an aggravating factor. It's an aggravating factor. Basically, it's, the, the, the sentence is going to increase. Yes. Okay. Okay. And it can increase because of specific facts to the, to, to the, uh, to the uh, event, or it can increase because of prior felonies. Okay, and the prior felonies that's what gives that's what gives rise to the persistent felony offender. Uh, if you've had one felony and you're currently charged with another one, assuming that you meet certain statu statutory criteria, you is the first time, for example, you have one felony conviction, you pick up another felony. That can be enhanced to what's called a PFO two. Okay, now that doesn't happen every time either. Right, right. Uh, these PFO charges, again, uh, technically they can be brought, but they're generally not unless somebody's hell-bound on this prosecution and, um, you know, and, and want, want to add that in. Uh, with one prior felony, that's a PFO, too. And it, the penalty for that, it raises you one level above... The underlying charge. Okay, so so if if there's this charge, generally in the range of two to five years or, or one to ten years in, in jail or prison, this takes us up to the next level. Yes. Okay. For example, uh, a class D felony, which is the lowest level at all, carries uh, one to five years, and there are some subdivisions of that, but they're not really significant for sure. for what we're what we're talking about here. Now, by virtue of a PFO 2, which means that defendant has a prior criminal conviction, instead of facing the base penalty for a Class D, which is 1 to 5, that can, a PFO 2, could be used to bump the penalty up from 1 to 5 to the next level, which is a Class C, 5 to 10. Okay. 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 And then, for those unlucky enough to have two priors, uh, two prior felonies, and again, assuming that you, um, assuming that you meet the criteria for, um, for both of those felonies qualify, then that bumps your penalty range up from where it normally would be, two levels. So that same scenario that we discussed about a class D and one to five. You wouldn't go, uh, PFO2 would get you 5 to 10. PFO1 gets you 10 to 20. Wow. So it becomes significantly uh, more painful. Yes. Wow. And, you know, they, they say they may tack that in or that, that comes into play. As a criminal defense attorney, are you also arguing to keep that consideration out of, this, of the uh, sentence? Well, unless it's indicted at the same time, and they can be, or... Sometimes it happens they've they they haven't indicted it as a PFO, uh, and they've made really good 
or they've made some kind of offers. Uh, if those offers are rejected and it's heading down the road for trial, uh, then you see lots of prosecutors bring a subsequent PFO charge. And they can do that as long as there's a case out there uh, that, has a, that has a current charge on it. They don't always do that. Right. Um, because lots of them settle and, you know, it, it's in, in some cases it could be piling on. But technically, it's it's a permissible action, right. um, but it, only only in maybe some of the most hardened uh, criminal characters would you see them going for that. And the PFO was really used um, to um, the PFO is really used when they want to tack on time and keep somebody away or put them away for an exceptional amount of time. Right. Right. And uh, I will tell you, because very, very rarely will you have, you'll have all the information on a PFO, uh, even if it had been charged well before trial. And of course, sometimes they make you offers that are so ridiculous that you can't accept them. Um, and it's probably 10 years ago. I, I had one and the offers were just outrageous. And, um, we uh, we got to the they they found him guilty in the uh, uh, in the penal in the I'm sorry in the um, uh, guilty phase, and so at that point in the um, in the uh, sentencing phase, all that evidence comes in, and they'll usually bring a probation and parole officer to uh, to explain what the 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 truth in sentencing uh, really means and what. Uh, what it really, uh, what it really amounts to is in terms of if if you send them for X number of years, what is the Y number of years that it's really going to be? Right, because and, I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to probably get out earlier than that. So a life sentence is not necessarily a life sentence. Not necessarily, um, but anyway, uh, the the case I'm the case I'm thinking of. We went to trial, and it was like shooting fish in a barrel. It was going to happen, but the offer was just so outrageous because of the PFO that they attacked on. And in the end, well, we, we, like, as I said, they found him guilty in the sentencing phase of a class D. And then usually there's no, not much question uh, unless somebody drops the ball in the sentencing phase because the PFOs are what the PFOs are. But in this particular case, um, I figured if I couldn't convince them, at least I could confuse them. <laughs> and that's the art of what you do. That that was the art behind that because after they convicted him in the or after they had found him guilty in the guilt phase, he was a slam dunk PFO one. Jury came back not guilty. Unbelievable. Not guilty. Unbelievable. Well, congratulations to you then on that one. Well, well, even a blind squirrel gets a nut. There you go. There you go. And, and just as an aside or a sidebar here, uh, I believe it was episode one. Uh, where we were introducing you and your practice, you also handle expungements. And if you want to know more about expungements, we may do a, a, a separate episode at some point on ex expungements, but that's a way to basically get your criminal record actually a charge basically cleaned off or erased from the record. Um, how does that come into play with a PFO situation? Um, if you've had the felony, let's say it were quite some time ago and you were actually able to get that expunged, let's say it was a Class D felony, uh, that came off. Can they pull that back on in this consideration when they're when they're talking about tacking that back on? No. Okay, that's gone. No, that's, that's gone. gone. Okay, another if, reason they need to talk to Tim. Exactly. <laughs> if it now when you get when you start talking about expunging cases with PFOs, it's tricky business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because if the if there's an enhancement of the PFO, generally there's not going to be. It's going to take that whatever that sentence is outside the range of what could normally be expunged. Right. But if you're lucky enough to, uh, and, and it happens all the time, uh, some people just indict the bare minimum. Some people indict what they think they can prove. And then others just, you know, go over the deep end and or they've got one good charge, but nevertheless, they'll bring 10. Just for the fun of it. Just, just for the fun of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, which used to work, but it's starting to backfire. Okay. Um, however, if you have a felony conviction, a Class D felony conviction, and it's not every one, but right now there are 61 
expungeable Class D felony convictions in Kentucky that can be expunged. And that's where the great majority of people of people fall. Um, after five years after the completion of the sentence, if the defendant has not been charged with another felony, so you've got the you've got the period from the time of the plea until the end of probation. Okay. You can go in and expunge that felony, the class D. Right, right. Um, and if that is uh, if that is done, then if they are ever charged again, the felony that was expunged does not play in. Never happened. can't be used. It never happened. And you you had mentioned once they uh, from the. From this point to the point where they're finished with their probation, that could also be if they've served time, the end of that sentence, end, end of that jail term. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, so it's not just probation. It, even if you've even if you serve time for it, generally you don't serve time on a D unless you're just a repeat screw up. Right. But you could. <laughs> but you you could. could. But you and could. and what you said there is still true. You could be a re- repeat screw up and finally get sent, and you could either serve out, at which point. Five years from that, you'd be eligible right. to uh, still apply for an expungement. Or you can, you know, if there's a diversion, it's an automatic uh, dismissal at the end of the time. And then you can apply to expunge the charge after that. Uh, with with these type charges, though, if, if, it's, if it is a uh, C or higher, it's probably not expungeable. Right, you're talking about the level of felony. The level of felony, yeah. right? Yeah. If if it is uh, if it is a D, it very well could be expungeable, depending on if it's in one of those sixty one. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And th- there may be some expansion of that, but so far with the with the pilot program on on expunging the DUIs, uh, it's gone pretty smooth. There haven't been a tremendous number of of problems with DUIs it. and other or DUIs or felonies. I'm sorry, felonies. Okay, felonies. Okay. Um, DUIs are a whole other yeah. horse because they have a different time frame involved. Look, look back period and all it, this stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But if you haven't, uh, if you haven't had any felonies uh, with within the five years prior to, I'm sorry, within the five years from the termination of the conviction, okay, or, or when they're off probation, yeah. then you can you assuming it's an, an an eligible offense, you can expunge that at any time. And that's obviously something, you know, we talked about this in episode one is when we were on this topic, even if you've been charged and later found not guilty, that charge is still on your record. Yes. And that's something you've got to look into. Yes. Another reason if, for them to call him. If, whether it's a felony charge uh, or a misdemeanor, if, if, if there's a conviction or if you're subsequently, if you're charged with it and subsequently found not guilty, it's still out there on your record. Yeah. A lot of right. people think that just naturally goes away because it, somebody made a mistake. No, no, it no, never goes away unless you take an active stance towards expunging it. Right, right. Well, let's kind of wrap up the episode with with, a, with another uh, consideration here. Uh, dealing with drug crimes and related charges, how do you approach it when it's a juvenile versus an, an adult? I mean, obviously, you know, if we can get somebody, a, a young kid, back on the right track, and, and I think that sounds like that's kind of the the spirit of the time right now, the zeitgeist right now is let's try to, you know, get people back on the right track through the exactly. diversion and stuff like that. How do you approach that? Well, it's actually easier in a lot of cases to deal with the juvenile because unless it is a, uh, unless, especially if it's a drug case, unless it has a violent crime or, uh, is attached to other charges that involve violent crimes, uh, you have a lot more options down there because the juvenile can actually plead to the felony in juvenile court, and it'll still be sealed when he turns eighteen. Now, if he's tried as an adult, different story. If there's a tr- the way that's determined, among other things, is uh, felony charges in juvenile court generally they handle. Okay, but if you get one or more of a more serious nature. Uh, for example, I'll give you a prime example is uh, a defendant taking a gun to school and shooting up the school. Right. Okay. Right. I'm not talking about just taking the gun to school. I'm talking about shooting up the school. If something like that, 
or any other any other felony that they want to, to try as an adult. There has to be a transfer hearing in the juvenile court. And there's a there's a list of factors under the juvenile code that the judge has to find. And if the judge finds those, and usually they don't put on the proof unless it's there, but at that point, the judge can make a judge will ultimately make the determination that yes, this is a this is a serious felony. Yes, it meets the criteria for transfer, and yes, I'm going to transfer it. So it's transferred out of juvenile court and transfer it to circuit court. Right. Correct. Right. Now, other instances, uh, the ju- the judge can also hear it, determine that the um, that the uh, offense meets the criteria, but deny the motion to transfer. That doesn't happen very often. If there's a transfer hearing and they think it's it's serious enough to warrant a transfer hearing, chances are it's probably going up and you're not going to win it. And they've done their homework. They're ready. Exactly. To make that motion or that. They are. Yeah. They are. Usually if they make that motion, I won't say every time because I've been involved in some that maybe should have gone up and didn't. Right. Uh, but by and large, when they make that motion, Ladies the criteria are there. You don't have a lot of, if you're the prosecutor, you don't have a lot of wiggle room once you ask for a transfer hearing. Right. Um, you know, unless someone's able to change your mind and they either withdraw it or after having the hearing, the judge says, well, it meets the criteria. It certainly uh, is a transferable offense, but for whatever reason in this particular situation, I'm not going to transfer it. But that that would be, if it were to go up, I mean, that would be, for instance, how you get a 15, 16, 17-year-old kid tried as an adult. Yes. Okay. It's generally, generally the charges that go up are charges involving guns, yep. uh, injuries, violent crimes. And again, considered aggravators to the charge? They can, absolutely, it can okay. be. Okay, just trying to tie all that together. Yes. Um, well, let's wrap up with this. I know we said we were going to close it up, but state versus federal. Um, this is always interesting to me. Is is when when does the the federal jurisdiction come into play? When when is something uh, a drug crime tried in federal court versus uh, circuit or district, which would be the state court system? Whenever the U.S. attorney wants it to be tried in federal court, yep. there's concurrent jurisdiction over drug crimes between state and federal courts. And gener- if it's not a slam dunk shooting fish in a barrel, the feds don't want it. <laughs> we got into that a little bit in episode four. We did. Or, I'm sorry, in episode three. Of the previous nothing, episode nothing about, about what we've done today changes that. Yeah. yeah. You know, if, they ca- if they can't kill it with one shot, they're not interested. Right. Uh, but they could take any drug case practically they wanted. Uh, without it, it, and that's that's simply put without getting into the politics politics of the wrath you would incur from the federal judges if you started bringing shit like that into their courtroom. Yep. Uh, so by and large, unless there's a boatload of drugs, <coughs> excuse me, and it's a slam dunk prosecution, the feds aren't taking it. Okay. But there are all those instances, and drug crimes do get litigated. Exactly, they they're prosecuted in the in the federal court system. Yes, and, and again, you're licensed to practice in federal court, and, I've, and you I've, do so. I've tried cases in federal and state court, all, all right. across the all well, all across the state. Yeah, yeah. Tim, let's uh, let's go ahead and call it an end and, and wrap up uh, this episode four. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know you're busy, and uh, friends, we're going to be back in two weeks with uh, with another episode here from uh, mercenaries and gunslingers in in uh, Tim Dennison. Tim. Uh, what's the best way if somebody's listening to this and thinking, Hey, you know what? Maybe this is the guy I need to give a call. How, what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you? Well, they can call my office, uh, which is answered 24 seven, uh, at five Oh two five eight nine six nine one six. They can uh, contact me through my website, which is Tim or they can send me an email directly, uh, which generally is the most effective and, and quickest uh, path of transmission, and I'll respond to it as quickly as I can. And that's at Timothy Dennison at AOL.com. Fantastic. Buddy, again, I appreciate your time. Thanks very much. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in two weeks. That's a wrap.
That wraps up this episode of Tim Dennison's Mercenaries and Gunslingers, the criminal defense podcast. Tim will be back in two weeks with another episode. For more information, visit timdennisonlaw.com. Follow him on Facebook at the Law Offices of Timothy Dennison. Until next time, remember, it's not about what they think. It's only about what they can prove. <laughs>